All right, today we're going to assume that you know how to maximize utility. You've done this before using a Cobb Douglas utility function. And we're going to use my shortcut method to get the marginal rate of substitution instead of doing it the long way. So we're using Perloff's textbook, and in chapter four is about utility and utility maximization. And in chapter five, we're using those ideas in order to see where demand comes from and a lot of other things. So let's get going. But first, let's do a very quick review of some of the ideas from chapter four so that they're all in our head. So in order to maximize someone's utility, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be given a budget. We're going to be given the price of X and given the price of Y and given the utility function. And from the utility function, if it's a Cobb Douglas, we can use this shortcut trick to where if our utility function looks something like this, U equals X to the A times Y to some exponent B, then the marginal rate of substitution it's just the exponent on the x times y divided by the exponent on the y times x. And the reason why that is, is marginal rate of substitution is the ratio of the marginal utility of x divided by the marginal utility of y. And when you do those partial derivatives, you get this function and this function. And when you divide one by the other, then you get this nice simple equation, ay over bx. So if you don't have a Cobb Douglas utility function, you just do the partial derivatives and then you do the ratio and simplify and, and whatever utility function you have, that'll give you the marginal rate of substitution. So what we have here is a problem where we're gonna have two equations in two unknowns. And these are the two equations. We wanna set the marginal rate of substitution, which tells us the slope of indifference curves equal to the ratio of the price of X over the price of Y, because that is the simplest way to represent the slope of a budget line. So we want those two slopes to be equal, and that's what this first equation is telling us. And the second equation just guarantees that we're spending all of our money, but not spending any more than we have. So it just says the amount of money times how many X we buy, or the price of X times how many X we buy, plus the price of Y times how many Y we buy has to equal our budget that we're going to spend. Now that we have those basics in mind, Let's do some problems where we're going to use these ideas. So in this chapter, we're going to use the utility maximization kind of tool in order to answer three kinds of questions. First of all, what happens when price changes? And so basically what we want to do is derive a demand curve by checking how much of a product somebody wants to buy as the price goes up and down. The second thing we want to do is we want to look and see what happens when income changes. So when income goes up, if it's a normal good, we expect people to buy more of the good and when income goes down, vice versa. But we could have an inferior good. So we want to look at demand shifts when income changes. And then we want to also look at something called the Slutsky equation. So when price changes, we want to be able to answer the question, how much does a price increase hurt people or how much does a price decrease help people? So that's the first part. And then second, we want to look at why do people change their optimal choices? And this is looking at a demand curve and trying to answer the question, exactly why is it that when price goes up, people buy less? And yes, it's common sense, but it's more than that. In economics, we want to be able to know exactly why. Now, there are two reasons, two distinct reasons why people buy less when the price goes up. First, part of it is due to the relative price change. The fact that when one price goes up, the opportunity cost of buying that product is now relatively higher because you have to give up more of the other product to get each additional unit of the one who's now more expensive. And then the other part is some of the idea of why you buy less when the price goes up is you feel poorer. So these are kind of due to income-like changes, and we call those income effects. So we have the substitution effect, you buy less because the opportunity cost is higher. The income effect, you buy less because now your opportunity set or the quantity of the two goods that you can buy with the income you have is now less because the price of one good went up. 
So when the price of a good goes up, your budget line is going to rotate in and it's going to make it to where there are some things you can't afford anymore. So here's the problem we're going to focus on today. We have this utility function x to the 0.4 times y to the 0.5. And we're going to start very simply with the price of X is 10, the price of Y is 10, and our budget is $200. So let's zoom into this part of the question. So what we want to do first of all is just use the tools that we already know. We know how to maximize utility. We're going to just practice that three times very quickly here. And we're going to find out what happens as one of the prices increases. So we're going to start off with the price of X is 10, price of Y is 10, and a budget of $200. Now, ceteris paribus, we're going to keep everything else the same, except we're going to change the price of y to 15 and then to 20, and we're going to see what happens. And what we're doing here is we're going to derive the demand curve for y. Because ceteris paribus, all we're doing is we're changing the price of y so we can see what happens when the only thing that's happening is people are buying less because the price changes for y. So let's set up our two equations. So our first equation, as we had up here, is we want to set the marginal rate of substitution equal to the ratio of the prices, and we're going to use our shortcut rule. The exponent on the x times y divided by the exponent on the y times x. And so using that shortcut rule for the first equation, we're going to have 0.4y over 0.5x equals and the ratio of the prices the price of x 10 over the price of y 10 well 10 over 10 is just going to give us 1 so I'll go ahead and simplify that let's go ahead and set up the equation for the other two problems just so we can do this as efficiently as possible so in this problem we have the same utility function we're not changing the person's preferences so the marginal rate of substitution is going to be the same Now, what is the ratio of the price is going to be? The slope of the budget line. Well, 10 over 15, and 10 over 15, we could go ahead and simplify it to two-thirds if we want. Now, you don't have to do that. And for the third problem, again, same utility function, so our marginal rate of substitution is not going to change. However, here we have the price of x is 10, price of y is 20. So 10 over 20, we could simplify that to a half or 0.5, however we want to represent that. And now the second equation in this kind of problem is going to be the budget line. And so we want the price of x times x. So here, $10 times x. Let me do that in a consistent color here. $10 times x plus $10 times y has to equal the $200 that we have to spend. And in the second equation, we're just going to change that price of y to 15. So 10 times x plus $15 for each y has to equal 200. And $10 for each x plus $20 for each y equals $200. And our standard way of going about trying to solve this kind of problem is to generally look at the first equation here, solve it for y, and then we'll plug that into the second equation and simplify. So take a second, solve this for y, and what are you going to get? Well, what I would do here is, is say, well, 0.4 over 0.5 is the same as 4 over 5, which is 0.8. And so we could rewrite this if we wanted to, to be 0.8 y over x equals 1. And then what we want to do is just divide both sides by 0.8 and multiply both sides by x to solve this for y. So we're going to end up, we'd have 1 over 0.8 and then we'd divide that by 0.8. So that goes away. And multiply both sides by x, so now we have the x over on the right-hand side. And to clean that up a little bit, we're going to have y equals 1 over 0.8, which is 1.25, times x. 
And now we're going to plug that in over here. So wherever we see y, we're going to replace it with 1.25x. And so we have 10x plus 10 times 1.25x equals 200. 22.5x's, right? 10x plus 12.5x equals 200. And divide both sides by 22.5. Kind of summarize over here. X is going to be 8.8888888. We can maybe round that to 8.89. Then plug that back into this equation right here, where it tells us Y is 1.25 times the amount of X. So take that 8.8888888 and multiply it times 1.25. And we're going to get that y is equal to 11.11. And then what we want to know here as well is how much utility is this person going to be able to get when they maximize their utility buying 8.89x's and 11.11y's. We'll just plug these numbers back into the utility function. So 8.88888 raised to the 0.4 times y 11.11111 raised to the 0.5 and put that in your calculators and see what you get. All right, what I get is something close to U equals 7.98. Now, as I always like to do, let's graph this and make sure that it's right. So graphing this first budget line, we have $200 and the price of X is 10, the price of Y is 10. So the easiest way is just to take the $200, divide it by the price of Y, and that'll give us our Y intercept here of 20. And 200 divided by 10, the price of X, is gonna give us the same thing, 20 down here. And then we wanna connect those with a straight line so we see what our budget line's gonna look like. And let's make sure that our solution was right. Now, if we look at our graph, what we're looking for is to see that the slope of our blue budget line is going to be tangent, same slope as one of these indifference curves. And it needs to be close to the indifference curve for 8, right? So over here in our legend, we have 8 is the green one. So it's looking good so far. The utility we calculated was 7.98, and here this is, this is 8. And our solution that we found was 8.89x and 11.11y. So let's graph that point on here. Should be about here, right? A little bit above 11 on the y-axis, close to 9 on the x-axis. You know, I should, I should probably move it down a little bit like that, okay? And so this is our optimal amounts of X and Y that we should purchase to maximize this person's utility, and the graph is checking out our mathematical solution there. Now, please, I'm begging you, if you want to learn how to do this, you have to practice. You have to get the reps in doing this yourself. It's got to become just second nature when you do this. So please, I'm begging you, pause the video here and do these and see what answers you get. And I'll come back and I'll fill in the answers. Pause the video now, please. Okay, so here's what your answers should look like. For the second problem, X is 8.89, Y is 7.4, utility about 6.5. And for problem three, X is 8.89, Y is about 5.55555 or 5.56, and utility should be about 5.65 utils. So again, these numbers tell us how much X the person should buy, how much Y, how many units of Y the person should buy, and then the utility is how happy will this person be. Now one thing, hopefully, you've already noticed that seems a little bit weird as you do these problems. You notice whenever we do equation two and we're plugging in this formula for y over here, we are always ending up with 22.5x equals 200 in each of the three cases, which means that x is always 8.889, 8.889, 8.889. 
what we're seeing here is a kind of strange side effect of using the Cobb-Douglas utility function. Now, the Cobb-Douglas utility function, it's great. It's wonderful. It's very useful. But it's not the only utility function out there in the world. And in fact, in a lot of situations, it does not make sense. So I've seen some people with PhDs out there using Cobb-Douglas utility functions to analyze a particular situation where they're not taking into account this weird side effect. And this weird side effect is that if the price of one good is changing, of course you're going to buy less of that good, right? So we see that here when the price of Y is only 10, we're buying 11 Ys. When the price goes up, we buy less Y. When the price goes up again, we buy even less Y. But this is something you always see with a Cobb-Douglas utility function is the good whose price did not go up or did not go down, you're going to buy the same amount of that good. So the same amount of X, as long as your budget's not changing, and as long as the price of X isn't changing, you're not going to buy a different amount of X. So again, this is a weird side effect with the Cobb-Douglas utility function that also makes it easier to work with if you're doing this in a class. You know what to expect. The answer for the good whose price is not changing needs to not be changing, right? The amount of that good you're going to buy shouldn't change. So what this is assuming, if you use a utility function that's a Cobb-Douglas in a problem as your model, you are making the underlying assumption that these two goods, they're not complements, they're not really substitutes, they are independent goods. Suppose these are two things like gasoline and apples. If the price of gasoline goes up, I'll buy less gasoline, but it's not going to affect how many apples I buy. These two goods are just totally unrelated. What we're assuming this person does, and again, this is determined by the fact that we're choosing a Cobb-Douglas utility function, any Cobb-Douglas utility function, anything that has this general form, x to a power times y to a power, you're going to get this same kind of behavior where what the person is going to do is they're going to split their budget and they're going to spend a certain amount on x and a certain amount on y. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about here. Do you see how here in each of the three cases, how much money are we spending on x? Well, in the first problem, since x is $10, we are spending 8.89 times $10, or we're spending $88.90, right? Or if we didn't round that off, it'd be $88.88 .88 on x. And that means we're spending the same thing here, $88.90 on x, and the same thing here. So we're pretending, we're kind of assuming, just based on the mathematics of the Cobb-Douglas utility function, that the person's going to divide their budget into two piles. One pile is always going to be spent on X, and the other pile's always going to be spent on Y. Since we only have two goods here, if this person is spending $88.90 on X, that must mean they're spending how much on Y all the time? Right. They're going to be spending the other $111.10 on Y. This is how they're dividing their budget. Now, where this really comes from is these two exponents, the 0.4 and the 0.5. What you can do if you do a little bit more analysis on this is you'll, you're going to kind of find that they're going to spend 0.4 out of 0.9 of their budget on X and 0.5 out of 0.9 of their budget on Y. It's just a, a little trick that's kind of cool to know. So in each of these three cases, they're going to be spending the same amount on X, the same amount on Y, and how much X and Y they get, it, it's really just determined by the price of X and the price of Y, right? So I'm, I know I'm going to spend this amount of money, almost $89 on X. I go to the store, I see what the price of X is. Hey, it's 10. All right, I'll buy 8.89 units of X. So let's graph these and let's see what this looks like on the graph. And then let's use this information in a couple of ways. So again, please, you pause the video and graph these budget lines 
And if you didn't catch it at the beginning of the video, I'll have a link to where you can download this handout. All right, so here's what our budget lines are going to look like. Since the price of Y is increasing, it's going to be rotating these budget lines down. You can see how our opportunity set, or the things we can afford to buy, are shrinking and shrinking as our price of Y goes up. And I've labeled these with the solution for problem one, solution for problem two, solution for problem three. And this y-intercept is just changing by dividing our budget by the prices of 10, 15, and 20. So that y-intercept is decreasing here as we go. Again, consistent with our relationship in our problems when we were solving them, we see that these three points are stacked right on top of each other vertically, right? So x is 8.89 as long as the price of x is ten dollars that's not going to change but we see how we're decreasing the amount of y that we're buying in each case now this little gold line that i've drawn here we have a name for that and what we're doing here is in our axis with the amount of x here on the x-axis the amount of y on the y-axis and with our indifference curve map if we just make a graph of how one's consumption of a product changes as its price changes, we call this graph in this kind of axis plane the price consumption curve. What it helps show us is how much X and Y you buy, how those things change as the price of one of the goods changes. So price consumption curve. Now the more familiar way that we represent this information is by making a demand curve. So let's do that over on this little graph on the right here. We have the price of good Y, we have the quantity of good Y, and we want to graph these three points. In problem number one, the price of Y was 10. We see that we were going to buy 11.11 Y. All right, so price is 10 and the quantity is 11.11, something like that. And then we saw that when the price went up to $15, we would want to buy 7.4Y. So we're just doing price and quantity graph here. All right, right about there. And then when the price goes up to 20, this person would buy 5.56Ys. All right, so. Now since we have three points here, where we have the price of Y changing, but nothing else changing, not income, not tastes or preferences, not the price of the other good, this is where demand curves come from. So if we just sketch, and for this demand, it is actually going to be a curve. So I'm kind of sketching a little bit of the curviness here. This would be the demand for good Y. So this is one thing we can do when we use this information. All right, let's go on to the next problem. We're going to keep the prices the same. We're just going to keep the prices $10 and $20. What we want to do in this case is we want to find the maximizing basket of X and Y, and we're going to keep the price of X 10, the price of Y 20, but we're going to add to what we already know, where we've done a budget of $200, what will happen if the budget goes to $300 and $400? So let's just graph that first budget line again that we, we have here. So this red budget line, we're just going to graph it down here. Y-intercept 10, X-intercept 20, so that we can have it all on the same graph here. And there's our little optimum point, the red point. Now what's going to happen if we add money to the budget? Well, let's solve this and it's actually going to be a very easy problem to do if we just look at problem number three here when we had the same prices and we just want to change the budget here from 200 to 300 and 300 to 400. Well the only thing that's going to change is we're going to add instead of having this just equal to 200 we're going to add that to 300 so we're going to have 22.5x equals 300 and 22.5x equals 400, right? Let's see what those are going to be. Again, pause the video, do it. Just takes one second. 
but you get those reps and you're going to get better at doing this. All right, so here's what I got whenever I plug these in. So we're just dividing the budget by 22.5 and we're getting the amount of X, the amount of Y, and as before, we get the amount of Y by multiplying the amount of X by 0.625. So what we get when we simplify equation one and solve it for Y. And then I went ahead and calculated the amount of utility that we get in each of these cases. Now, in this graph, let's graph the other two budget lines and let's see what happens. So again, to get the budget lines, we take the budgets of 200, 300, and 400 and divide them by the price of X. And we're gonna get 20 as we did here. And then for the next one, we're gonna get 30, 300 divided by 10 and 400 divided by 10, 40. And then for the y-intercepts, we get 200 divided by 20, 10. We get 300 divided by 20, 15. And we get 400 divided by 20, or 20. All right, so let's draw those budget lines in there, and let's see what these solutions look like when we compare the three, so we can see what an increase in income looks like. So there are three budget lines, and we see that the budget lines increase parallel. A parallel shift represents an increase or a decrease in your budget or your income. And let's graph those solution points here. So 13.33x's is going to be roughly here. And 17.78x's. And we want to make sure that the amount of y is consistent as well. So about 11 for the third problem. Y is about eight for the second problem and about five and a half for the first problem. And notice how over here on the right, I have in difference curves that we're close to the ones that we're tangent to. So 10 and a half, the pink one here, and eight, this one, we're a little beyond it since we're getting a little more than eight utils here for the second income of 300. And then the first one, 5.5. Again, we're just a little bit beyond it since we have a little bit more than five and a half utils. So again, this is just a way to visualize what happens when income goes up ceteris paribus. Both of these are normal goods because we're buying more of each. Now, if we draw a line through these points, or a curve as it may be in some cases, then what we call this connecting the optimal bundles as only income is changing, we call that an income consumption curve. At least the names make sense here, right? And let me just point out right here that the equation of this income consumption curve is just simply going to be this y equals 0.625x. So we can extend this income and consumption curve as a ray through the origin. That's just the line y equals 0.625x. So we had a price consumption curve before. What happens to the optimal baskets as the price of one good changes? And here, what happens to the optimal baskets as only income is changing? The other curve that we did was a demand curve, where again, we're looking at what happens to the amount of X or Y someone buys as only its own price changes. So here we were looking at the price of Y and the quantity of Y. So that's where a demand curve comes from. And now the last thing I want to do is show you these points that we were just looking at on this demand curve plane. What happens as the person's income goes up? What we're going to be doing is comparing to this point at a price of 20. What happens as the person's income goes up to 300 or 400? Well, those optimal amounts of Y at 300 when the price is $20 is 8.33 units. And then when they have $400, it's gonna be a little over 11 units of Y. So let's go up here and let's look at the old demand curve when the demand curve was at $200. And now we have this point that's 
about 8.33 of y, and then we have the purple point, which is about 11 y. But in these two points, they're not on this original demand curve. We see that the willingness and ability of people to buy this good Y has increased two times as their income or their budget has gone up two times. So what that means is the green point must be on some kind of different demand curve for Y. In other words, demand increased because income went up. And similarly, with a higher budget, there must be some demand curve here that's even higher. Demand went up again because income went up again. Now, we could solve several other problems for other prices at these two new incomes of 300 and 400 if we wanted to really fill out some of these points for these other two demand curves. But the main point here is just to illustrate that demand is increasing. All right, so I'm going to end this video here, and I'm going to come back with a second part where we're going to finish this worksheet. And what we're going to do in that part is we're going to focus on using utility maximization ideas to use the what we call the Slutsky equation to decompose. We know when price goes up, people buy less. But why? As we were talking about before, there's two reasons. There's the income effect and the substitution effect. And that's why I have this picture of this guy over here. Yevgeny Slutsky. Yevgeny Slutsky. Russian mathematician from the 1800s, early 1900s. He's the person who came up with this thing we call the Slutsky equation that breaks apart the two reasons why you buy less when the price of something goes up. You're going to buy some amount less because you feel poorer. That's the income effect. And you're going to buy some amount less because the opportunity cost of buying that good has increased relative to buying the other good. And so we're going to learn how to do that in the next video. So please join me for that.